happen promoted by next week or it not by next week This last one minute, uh, we, we are seeing that people are still trickling in. Um, do not want to make it an India stretchable time, IST, but so we'll start in another minute or so. Thank you for your patience, everyone. James, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Um, so, James, in, uh, it's three or four, another minute or so, we, because I'm just seeing people are still coming in. <laughs> and I, we are very particular about time, so we had made it sure that we'll start sharp at three or five. So people can join in. First and foremost, thank you so much, James, for coming in. So how, how is Delhi treating you so far? So I'm so happy that you are in, in our city. It's very well. It's, 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 um, I was... My first time in Delhi, I was in, I was speaking in Chennai earlier in the year, and uh, that was the first time I'd been to Chennai as well. So, hopefully, I'm I'm here speaking at a conference, and uh, maybe tomorrow I'm going to get a chance to explore the city a little bit, go and see some of the, the fantastic sights of Delhi. Are you are you checking out Taj Mahal or not? Because that's supposed to be the must place to visit for everybody who comes from outside. Well, I promised my wife that I wouldn't go there on my own that she said, that's, yeah, I'm going to have to wait for her to come with me next time I come here. And then I'm going to take my wife there. Oh, that's awesome. It is actually not a place to be visiting alone, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so next time when you're here with your wife, do give, me, give us a ping. I would love to, you know, help you to create your itinerary. Your wife. Thank you very come. much. Yeah. Thank you. It's very kind of you. Great. So thank you so much, James. And we have close to almost around, what, 40 odd participants joining in and they're still trickling in. So we'll start because we don't want others who have joined us on time to be waiting, kept waiting for others who did not. So as usual, as everybody knows, uh, Beyond Diversity is very well known for starting all the sessions, all their programs, all the initiatives on time and finishing on time. So I would like to first and foremost welcome all of you um, at this webinar and thank you so much for joining in. My name is Sarika Bhattacharya. I am the CEO of Beyond Diversity. Some of you know me because I've connected with you in some program in some session or the other. And for the others um, who have been interacting with Rajiv and Nancy, um, they are very much here near my, near my thing. Possibly uh, they can get their video on and they can also say hi to everyone. And uh, the idea was that, you know, that every month we bring in some global thought leader who is doing some amazing work. And they are the ones who are also helping us to understand the diverse perspectives in terms of the work life, in terms of what's future holds for us, as well as what are the different types of views which we are bringing in from diverse geographies. So I'm so glad to introduce you to James Taylor. And um, as you can see, James is very much in our uh, Delhi uh, hometown. Uh, and he was speaking in the, one of the largest HR conference known as People Matters HR Tech Conference. Unfortunately, James, I could not attend today. Most probably I'll be there tomorrow. Uh, are you there tomorrow as well? Over in the Yes. Conference? Yes, I'll, I'll actually be speaking there tomorrow as well. Oh, fantastic. Then possibly we'll meet you in person as well then. So as just mentioning, James is an award-winning speaker, internationally recognized leader in creativity and innovation. He has been teaching entrepreneurs, educators, corporate leaders, writers, rock stars, and some of his most amazing set of clients are the ones who are, I mean, who is in the who's who list. For the last 20 years, he's been working them, helping them to build innovative organizations and de design their creative life they desire. As the founder of C-School and host of the Creative Life podcast and TV show, he's taught hundreds and thousands of individuals in over 120 countries. If that's not global for you, then what is? Um, of course, he has written many books, videos, and of course, keynote speeches. Um, I almost talk, to be honest, James, I almost talk you at Twitter. So here's for all of you who wants to get his everyday nudges and tidbits. You can stalk him on Twitter as well. And there's so much of information that every day morning you say, oh, wow. There's so much new to learn every day. Uh, he has also been advising many uh, world's most creative individuals and companies, ranging from Grammy award-winning music artists 
and best selling authors to silicon valley startups and innovative multinationals recognized as a worldwide authority on creativity innovation and marketing james is the recipient of the modern entrepreneur award the sd southern award and also holds a masters in business administration thank you so much james for joining in and we look forward to uh, learning from you we look forward to your insights and perspectives and have a great interactive session so over to you james well thank you sarika for inviting me to come and give this presentation today and it's a uh, it's always a delight to be back here in India as well. And I know we, we probably have lots of attendees from all different parts of the, the country. So wherever you're joining us from in India or in the world, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be speaking with you today. So I thought what I would do is um, really share with you about how to unlock your creative potential. Um, but before I start that, let's, let me start with a quick, quick story here. Uh, on May 11th, 19... 97 in a small New York City conference room something happened which is going to change the lives of everyone that's on this webinar just now it's been hailed as one of the most momentous occasions in human technology on a par with the Wright brothers first flight or the moon landings in the middle of the room was a table and on that table was a chessboard on one side of the chessboard sat Gary Kasparov the world's greatest chess player and the other side was Dr. Murray Campbell who was a computer scientist from IBM Dr. Campbell's job was to move the chess pieces at the instruction of IBM's artificial intelligence supercomputer, Deep Blue. Now, Deep Blue didn't think and play chess like a human, like you or I, with human intuition and creativity. Instead, it played like a machine, systematically evaluating up to 200 million moves per second using brute force logic. But the reason why the room was packed this day with news crews and journalists from all over the world was this wasn't just about a game of chess. This was about the contest between humans versus machines, a contest that was going to define this century. So the first game began and Gaspar played a move that's called the King's Indian Attack and allowed him to take the advantage and win that first game. One nil to the human race. Yay! But game two was a draw, and this put Kasparov off balance a little bit. By the time they got to game five, someone overheard Kasparov saying, I'm not afraid to admit, I'm afraid. And in game six, something extraordinary happened. In an opening game move, Kasparov made a mistake that was so obvious, the spectators in the room gasped in disbelief. Deep Blue had won the game. Deep Blue had won the match. Now, it's five times easier to become a dollar billionaire than it is to beat Gary Kasparov at chess. This was proof of ever we needed that the machines were finally able to do the kind of complex cognitive task that we'd always thought were the preserve of our human brains. Machines were finally coming for the white collar workers, the college educated, educated and the decision makers. So what can you and I do to ensure that we don't just survive but we thrive in this age of artificial intelligence. There is one skill more than any other that you need to develop in yourself and in your people in order to take advantage of this fourth industrial revolution. Now, here's some good news for everyone. You already have this skill. You were all born with it. My job today is to show you how you can develop that skill. And that skill is your creativity. And it's not just me saying this. Um, in fact, before, before we go any further, let me just ask to make sure the chat's working here. And um, we're going to get to Q&As at the end. Um, but let me, in the chat box, say, let me know if, would you describe yourself as being a creative person? So just say yes or no. Let's, let's have a look just now, see in the chat box. Let me know whether you would describe yourself as being a creative person. So no, no, not at all. Yes, no, yes, yes. So we, we, so we, have, a, we have a little bit of a somewhat, yep, yeah, yeah. So we have a, we have a, a real mixture here as well. Now, I'm going to ask a slightly different question. Do you believe that creativity is important for the work that you do? So say yes or no if you believe that creativity is important for the work that you do. Yes, yes, very much. Yes. Yep. So you all recognize the importance of creativity for this, this future work, this fourth industrial revolution you're going for. You'd be absolutely right. According to the World Economic Forum, creativity is going to move from the 10th most important job skill to the third most important job skill by next year. It's going to be more important than negotiation skills um, and uh, things like service orientation. 
According to one study done the other day by IBM, they interviewed 1,500 global CEOs. And according to these global CEOs, creativity is now the most important leadership quality for success in business today. A very recent study, this just came out. This is from LinkedIn. And they looked at the most important soft skills and most important uh, hard skills. Now, obviously, the most important hard skills were around things like artificial intelligence, machine learning. But the most important soft skill that companies are looking for is creativity. So creativity is right there at the top. Jack Ma, the other day, the founder of Alibaba, was asked the question, what skill do you think is most we need to be training our people and also our young people on? And he said, don't bother competing with a machine on things that could do better, faster, and cheaper. You have to focus on that one advantage you have as a human, your creativity, your, your ability to innovate. At this point, what I'm going to do just now is I'm seeing my video is just that is uh, starting to pixelate a little bit. So I'm going to switch my video off just now uh, to make sure you should still be able to see the slides. Okay, so this is um, me. Uh, I was brought up in Scotland, in the United Kingdom. And as a child, my parents used to make me walk up the summits of the mountains near where we lived. But they would make me walk up them dressed in a kilt. Now, if you don't know a kilt, a kilt is a traditional dress or a skirt that a Scotsman wears. So imagine walking up huge mountains in the rain, in the wind, in the snow, while wearing a skirt. My parents thought it would build character and resilience in me. And the reason I tell you this little story is you can think of this fourth industrial revolution that we're going into just now, this, this age of artificial intelligence, like a landscape that's slowly being flooded. But this is the landscape of human skills or competences. In the lowlands, we have skills like arithmetic, and memorization. In the foothills, you have skills like logic and chess playing. And in the high mountain peaks, you have skills like emotional intelligence, resilience, critical thinking. What happened about 50 years ago was the first wave of automation came through and it drowned out the lowlands, taking away lots of blue collar jobs. But today, this flood is reaching the foothills and those knowledge workers, like probably everyone on this call just now, is going to have to contemplate retreat and trying to get to that higher ground. Now, creativity lies at the peak of that mountain, above the flooded plains and foothills. See, creativity is about bringing new ideas to the mind. Innovation is about bringing new ideas to the world. Without creativity, there are no new innovations, there are no new products and services. Creativity is the engine of innovation. But we have a little bit of a problem now. So that first question I asked there was, how many people thought of themselves as creative? Um, and you, the, what you were saying there was very common across the, across the world. Wherever I speak, uh, roughly around 60% of the population would describe themselves as not being creative. Only 40% would describe themselves as being creative. And it, it fluctuates slightly depending on which country you're speaking in, but pretty much that's, that's where it is. So think about that for a second. That means that most people around the world do not consider themselves to have the one skill that's going to be most needed to survive and thrive in this age of artificial intelligence. In fact, a friend of mine, Dr. K.H. Kim, who's a, a South Korean uh, scientist and researcher, she found out that IQ levels have been increasing around the world for many years, but creativity levels have actually been declining. So what's going on? Why do most people today either not consider themselves to be creative or if they do consider themselves to be creative, they're not doing anything to develop that skill? There's really a number of myths that we tell ourselves as adults that hold us back from doing our most creative, our most innovative work. Because I believe that we are all born with almost unlimited creative potential. This is a wonderful quote from Pablo Picasso. He said, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist when they grow up. So the only proof that I need to show you that we are all born creative is for us to spend any time with a, a four-year-old or a five-year-old. Give them some crayons or some paints. Watch as they create. They lose all track of time. They're in what psychologists would call a flow state. Now think of your average office or work environment. As you look around those people, are they being creative? Are they being curious? Are they in a flow state? All too often, not. So what's going on there? Well, there's a number of myths that we tell ourselves. 
that we're going to break and we're going to bust some of these myths today. The first myth is this idea of the creative type. And this is the myth that says there are creative people and there are uncreative people. That some people are just born creative and some people aren't. Nothing could be further from the truth. A better way of thinking about creativity is on a continuum with big C creativity at one side and small C creativity at the other. Small C creativity is when you do things which are new, novel, and useful. New, novel, and useful. So let's imagine, you know, I love cooking. So when I'm at home cooking and I'm trying in different recipes, I'm trying different things. So, oh, what happens if we put that spice in? See what happens there. Now this is, I'm doing something which is new, novel, and useful. However, there's another type of creativity called big C creativity. A big C creativity is where you do things which are new, novel, and useful, and they change the domain or the field or the industry in which you work. So let me give you an example. This is Zaha Hadid. Zaha Hadid is one of the greatest architects that's ever lived. She had this beautiful flowing design. So you'll see your buildings all over the world. Now, she was a big C creative. She did work which was new, novel, and useful. And it changed the domain. It changed the field of architecture. This is my cat, Parker. Now, Parker is always coming up with new, novel, and perhaps useful ways of killing mice, sometimes bringing them into our home, but he's unlikely to change the pest control industry anytime soon. But what all creativity researchers agree on is that we all operate somewhere on this continuum from small C creativity and big C creativity. We're all creative. The second myth is this myth of the lone creative genius. This is the idea that creativity is purely an individual pursuit. For the first 20 years of my working life, I managed the careers of high profile rock stars. I worked with members of the Rolling Stones, multiple Grammy award winners. And sometimes I would be standing at the side of the stage watching as my artists perform. And if I looked on the stage, I would see them with the spotlight on them and holding the microphone. And if I looked to my left, I could see the thousands, the tens of thousands of people in the audience all enjoying the show. But if I look to my right, I can see the hundreds, the 200 people backstage and behind the scenes. Now, you as an audience member, you only ever get to see the person on the stage with a spotlight on them. You really get a chance to see the hundreds of 200 people backstage who are just as much a part of making a creative and successful show as the person with the spotlight on them on the stage. You know, the media loves this idea of the lone creative genius the singer on the stage uh, or the CEO on the front cover of the magazine, as if that CEO had single-handedly built that business. But you know that's a lie. It's a fiction. Creativity is collaborative. Creativity is actually a team sport. You know, the ways that the ancient civilizations from India and across Asia, Africa, and South America, and Europe, where I'm from, it was always felt that we were actually vessels for creativity. The inspiration ideas flowed through us. Now, those ideas could come from the gods, a higher power, it could come from the environment, it could come from the people in which you work, your community. It could even come from the place itself in which you're working and creating. And the, the ancient Greeks had a term for this, they called it the genius loci. This idea that places themselves could have their own creative genius. And if you've ever been somewhere, maybe uh, out in nature or, or in a forest or by the water, or maybe you've been in an art gallery and ideas have started coming to you and you felt inspired, you've experienced what we call the genius loci. So places themselves, not just individuals, can have their own creative genius. And the third myth that holds us back from doing our most creative and innovative work is what uh, this idea that you can't teach creativity. In fact, I could measure everyone's creativity just now, it's on this call, and we could do a, a half day creativity training like I do for lots of companies around the world. And by the end of that training, I would have actually seen your creativity levels increase. And I could use it, I could test it using something called the Torrance test. So creativity is actually teachable. It's a bit like learning a language. You know, for example, if, if I was trying to learn French for the first time, you know, I might understand some basic vocabulary, but I can improve upon it and develop it over time. And one country that really took this to heart was Singapore. So Singapore, a small city state of only 6 million people, but it knew that its greatest resource, its greatest assets were its people. 
So what they decided to do around the founding of the country, when in a few, you know, uh, around the 60s, they decided to put creativity training into the schools, into the colleges, into the businesses and the government ministries. And as a result, Singapore is one of the most creative, most innovative countries in the world. So creativity is teachable, creativity is trainable. After Gary Kasparov was beaten by Deep Blue at chess, he went to a pretty dark place. Imagine for a second what it would feel like to have spent your whole life becoming really skilled at your job, only for a machine to come along and do it better, faster, and ultimately cheaper. That sensation is about to be felt by hundreds of millions of people around the world over the next few years. But after Kasparov and the other chess grandmasters dusted themselves off, they thought, hold on, what about, instead of thinking of these machines as my competitor, what if I thought about them as my collaborator? And what happened next in the world of chess is a useful preview of what's going to happen in all of our jobs. You see, we're actually now starting to end an era of human versus machine. An entirely new era is starting based upon human plus machine collaboration. And we call these hybrid collaboration systems centaurs after the half human, half beast creatures of ancient mythology. A modern equivalent for this would be in the movie Iron Man, where you have the Tony Stark character played by Robert Downey Jr., who has an AI assistant called Jarvis. And together, Tony Stark and Jarvis, they create and they build these amazing things. You know, regardless of where I travel around the world, we see centaurs. I was in Denmark recently, and the centaur in Denmark is the mermaid, the half woman, the half fish. This idea that you're combining two, often think we think as distinct things, to create something that's magical, that's amazing. But today, this idea is no longer a fiction. Today, centaur chess players exist, and a centaur chess player is a human chess player paired with an AI, that's working alongside an AI. And that centaur chess player, that human chess player working alongside an AI, will beat any human chess player any day of the week but it would also be any artificial intelligence working on its own. That's because centaurs combine our ability to be creative, to be strategic, to ask questions, with a machine's ability to be tactical. And when we apply this centaur mindset, this human plus machine mindset, to doing any type of innovative or creative work, I call this super creativity, augmenting your human creativity that you already have with exponential technologies like AI, like machine learning, like robotics. So as humans, we're creators, we're makers, we're builders of things, of products and services, companies and countries. Usually an idea has to start with us sketching it out, but what about instead, we just told an AI what we wanted to accomplish. Today, we can use something called augmented design, which is type, a generative design, which is a type of super creativity. So we can just say, let's say I want to design a chair. I can tell the AI, I want a chair, it needs to support this much weight, to weigh this much, it needs to cost this much and be made from these materials. And AI will then go and create thousands of different designs based upon that criteria that you've selected. Then what we do is the humans review all these designs and they decide which ones are we gonna prototype, we're gonna create models of. And then the final design is strong, lightweight and durable and it might not have been the kind of design that would have been created by a human on their own. The next time you go on an Airbus A380, and travel on that plane, have a look around you and the panels, the compartments above your head. Many of them have used this type of generative design of humans plus machines working together. So the, the engineers tell the AI, we need a panel to be this much weight, to be this size, to be made from these materials. It creates thousands of different designs, all based upon that criteria, all conforming. And then the human engineers create prototypes of the ones they think look the most promising. And the final designs are much stronger than either a design that a human or a machine could have created on their own. It's super creativity at work. So I find this amazing. Imagine what we could create if we could combine the best of us with exponential technologies like AI. Imagine the problems that we could solve in the world. Imagine the, the products and the services that we could create. But in order to do this, it requires that we do things differently and we do different things. Because in this new age, of artificial intelligence, our job now, more than any other time, is to be the creative one, to be the strategist, to be the architect. The machine's job is to be the tactician, 
to crunch the data. That's the job now of the machine. So I've got a little surprise here. I didn't mention this to uh, Sarika before we came on the call, but if you want to take a, a quick screenshot of this slide, and I, I'm going to give everyone here that would like it an access to my online course on creativity. This is a 40 video online course. Um, and uh, all you have to do is take a photo of this, email my team at support at jamestaylor.me, and they will send you access to this online course. And it goes into huge amounts of depth on the creative process itself. So what I wanted to do just now though, is I want to leave you a couple of things that you can do to develop your own creativity and the creativity of your people, your teams. When I go and speak to companies uh, and I, I train their people on creativity, innovative thinking, I use this model, I call it TIPS for short. And it's, uh, it stands for team creativity, individual creativity, peer creativity, and super creativity. Team creativity is about teaching a, a number of strategies so that your team can be better at generating ideas together and can break down silos and can collaborate more creatively. Individual creativity is about giving you the tools and some of the, uh, the, the processes in order to better generate and develop and execute on new ideas. Peer creativity is what organizations like uh, Beyond Diversity are all about. It's where we get together to discuss, debate, and challenge ideas. And then finally, super creativity is all about using technology like AI, like machine learning, to augment your human creativity. So let me give you a bit of an overview of the creative process just now. The better you can become at each of these stages in the creative process, the more creative work that you will actually produce. Uh, and the more better you will be for this new, uh, the more, more prepared you'll be for this new age that we're going into just now. So there's five steps of the creative process, the preparation stage, the incubation stage, the insight stage, the evaluation stage, and finally, the elaboration stage. So the first stage is the preparation stage. Let's say if you're looking to enter into a new market with a product or a service, the first stage you would have is what we call the preparation stage, where you research the market, you look at the competitive landscape, you uh, find out as much as possible about the space itself, about the, the market you're going into and the product that you're gonna be putting into that market. At this stage of the creative process, the preparation stage is more about absorbing as much information as possible, more than it is about necessarily generating ideas. However, something I would really encourage you to do is to keep what we call morning pages. Um, morning pages are very simple. And the reason we do morning pages is you would never think about going and running a marathon without first warming up. In the same way, I don't suggest you kind of go in and immediately start doing you know, really creative work unless you kind of warm your creative mind, your creative muscle up each day. And as something we used to, to do this, to warm that creative mind up is called morning pages. It's very simple, very low tech. All it requires is that you have a journal and when you get up in the morning, first five, 10 minutes, I'd like you to just to journal to write maybe three pages, top of mind, stream of consciousness thoughts out onto the page. It could be random thoughts, ideas, maybe quotes you've seen, little bits of inspiration, things you wanna research, learn about. The point here is no one's gonna ever gonna see these pages apart from you. But what you're doing is you're getting initial thoughts out of your head into some type of physical form and you're starting to warm up that creative mind, that creative muscle each day. The second stage of the creative process is called the incubation stage. So once you've done a lot of preparing, you've done a lot of research, often what people try and do is immediately start to come up with ideas. But actually what you need to do is to put things to the back of your mind for a little while. Let your subconscious do the heavy lifting and do the churning in your head as it thinks and sees the possible connections. When I used to live in, in Silicon Valley in California, uh, I was always very intrigued how companies there would change everything from the, the ergonomics, the way their buildings, their offices work, to even the colors on the walls in the offices to change how people could incubate and generate ideas. So the fascinating little study that came, came along, uh, it was from the University of Berlin in Germany. And they actually found that different colors will, will affect your creativity in different ways. So for example, if you're ever doing work which requires high attention to detail, let's say you're filling in tax returns, you wanna have that color red around you because it activates a part of the brain which is all about focus. So that, that's good for that. However, what they found is the best color to have around you if you're wanting to generate and think creatively is the color green. 
Now, think about that for a second. It's one of the reasons we get some of our best ideas when we're out walking in nature, when that color green is all around you. So have a look around your work at your space that you're in just now. Do you have that color green around you? Maybe you've got a great view into a park or some, some woodlands near where you are. But if you don't, do you have some plants that you can bring into the office so you have that color green around you? So it's activating that part of the brain. Once you've incubated ideas for a while, then we start having those insights, those aha moments, the light bulbs start going on. Now, I just say here, this picture isn't me. Uh, I should probably go to the gym a little bit more often. But the reason I put this picture up is many people get their best ideas in the shower in the morning. And the reason for that is if you think about it, what people have done is you've, you've been preparing, you've been thinking about a problem or a challenge in your head, maybe the day before. Overnight, you've incubated that thought, that idea, um, or those, those, that, that challenge you're looking to solve. And in the morning, your brain is unwound, it's fuzzy. You're open to unconventional thoughts. Alpha waves are rippling through your brain, directing your attention inwards to remote associations that emanate from the right hemisphere. And suddenly these ideas start coming to you in the morning. That's why we get some of our best ideas in the shower in the morning. So it's very important for you to know what time of day you are your most creative. And then you can structure your days around this. So, you know, in the chat box here just now, let me know, for example, if you are your most creative, your ideas come easiest to you in the morning, put morning, type morning in there in the chat box. If your ideas come easiest to you in the afternoons, maybe after lunch, that's when your ideas start coming to you, type in afternoon. And perhaps for some of you, you get your best ideas and ideas come easiest to you in the evenings, perhaps the wee small hours, in which case type evening. So let's have a look here just now in the chat. Let's see what people are saying. Yeah, we've got lots of morning people. Uh, we've got lots of late night people. And some people are saying, well, yeah, I get it in the morning and also late night in the evenings. So now you've got a sense of when in the day you are your most creative. So what I'd like you to do is think about how you can structure your day to take advantage of that. So what you want to try and do as much as possible is do all your creative, your deep thinking at those times of day when you're at your creative peak. And any things like uh, calls, emails, as much as possible, meetings, any admin related things, you want to put them outside of that time. So you can really make the best use of that creative time each day for yourself. Okay, even what we drink and eat can affect our levels of creativity. Martha Farrar is a neuroscience professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And she found out that high levels of caffeine, coffee in your diet, will actually reduce you having creative insights. So I'm speaking today in India, in the land of tea. Now here's the good news. You are much more likely to come up with creative ideas and generate creative ideas if you're drinking tea as opposed to if you're drinking coffee. Why is this? Well, caffeine, coffee, is very good. High levels of caffeine is very good if you're looking to do just be focused work. So it's very good actually at the preparation stage and also at the last stage of the creative process. But when you're looking for your mind to be expansive, to be open, you want to dial down on the caffeine, switch to maybe things like tea or juices or water. On the flight coming here to, uh, to Delhi yesterday, um, someone was sitting next to me on the plane and she was asking me what, what I do. And I said, I speak about creativity and innovation. And she said, oh, you know, I work at a really creative company. We do brainstorming sessions. It's great. And brainstorming sessions are often used for the fourth stage of the creative process, what we call the evaluation stage, where you, you generate all these ideas and you have to decide which ones are we going to create, which ones we're going to go ahead with and prototype, for example. However, most companies do brainstorming sessions completely wrong. Let me know if you've ever experienced this. Have you ever been called into a brainstorming session or an ideation session where there's maybe a problem or challenge everyone's looking to solve? or and you're looking at developing ideas for a new product or service, and you go in the room, and there's only one whiteboard pen, and it's being held by the one, uh, usually it's a man, <laughs> in the room, and somehow it's his ideas end up dominating the board. So here we're all about diversity. The best thing you can do is have diversity in those ideation sessions. One of the reasons, obviously, there's so much research coming out now about those organizations which have diversity in the boardroom are more likely to do well in difficult times. 
And for ideation sessions and brainstorming sessions, you want to ensure that you have as much diversity as possible because you get the w widest range of ideas. So a couple of tips here for your next brainstorming or ideation session. The first thing is, especially if you work with engineers, you should tell them in advance what the challenge of the problem is. Is because some people don't think very well spur of the moment. They need a little bit of time to think and reflect before coming and sharing their ideas with others. That's absolutely fine. Then, when everyone comes into the room for a brainstorming session, everyone should be given post it notes and pens. No one should be allowed to dominate the board with their ideas. The final thing I'm going to share with you on this is what I prove the quality of any brainstorming or ideation sessions that you do where you're looking to generate and develop ideas. So here's how it works. You know, Peter Drucker, the management theorist, said the most common source of mistakes in management decisions is the emphasis on finding the right answer rather than the right question. You know, there was a uh, there was another uh, quote I saw the other day from the, the writer Voltaire, the French writer Voltaire, and he said, judge a person by the quality of their questions not their answers. So what we have to do in that first 10 minutes of any brainstorming session is actually focus not on the solutions, but focusing on actually the questions and thinking about the question itself, reframing the question. So this is something you can do just now. Write down what is one challenge at your organization that you care deeply about? And we all have lots of challenges in our organizations, but what is the one that you personally care about? Then what I would suggest you do is you organize some type of brainstorming session. And in your groups, I, take some time to just, first of all, go around the room and discuss and, and just talk about that problem, how everyone sees this particular challenge or this problem. The next thing you're going to do, now normally what would happen is people start looking to generate ideas about how to solve that problem or that challenge. But actually I want you to do something slightly different. So step two is each person in that room is going to spend five minutes generating as many creative, curious, and interesting questions as possible about the challenge. They're only going to be looking to generate questions. There's a couple of rules if you do this exercise. The first rule is the person whose challenge it is should write down all the questions word for word as you hear them. So you're almost, you're the note taker. The person whose challenge it is should also not try to answer any of the questions at this stage. You just stay silent and you just look to, to li listen to all those questions coming related to that particular challenge. If, you're, if you are the person that's posing all these questions around this particular challenge, don't feel that you have to explain why you're asking the question itself. Also, don't feel to explain, I, I'd be afraid to ask silly or what you might think as simplistic questions. At the end of that process, each person in the group should ask at least five questions so you'll have maybe a total of 15 to 20 questions for each challenge. So let's say, for example, you're thinking about entering into a new market. You know, I might be generating lots of questions about, well, first of all, why are you even going into this market in the first place? Why are we thinking about working with this partner? Is this the right uh, type of customer that we should be targeting this project? So I'm not generating solutions or answers. All I'm doing is generating questions at this stage. And then step three is you would look at all the questions you've received in relation to your challenge. And I want you to identify a few what we call curious questions. Curious questions are those questions which hold the most potential for disrupting the status quo if you were to find the answer. Then what you do is you commit to researching these questions and finding the answers themselves. Now, this method of spending the first 10 minutes of any brainstorming or ideation session just asking questions related to the challenge is something that people, companies like Adidas and Coca-Cola and World Economic Forum, the Genentech, they all use this type of process. And the reason we do this is it will improve what we call your divergent thinking, so your, your expansive thinking, it will often help you reframe the challenge itself. So what you actually might find is that the thing you thought was a problem is actually not really a problem, it's actually something else. It also forces you to think more strategically. You have to go up one level. And it will also help you uncover some of those mad ideas. So very simply, spend the first 10 minutes of any brainstorming or ideation session by answering as many questions as possible and identifying the curious ones which might lead to an innovative solution or an answer. And then the final stage of the creative process is the elaboration stage. So 
and you've you've prepared, you've researched an area, you've incubated it, thought, you know, put it to the back of your mind, you've started generating ideas, insights, you've evaluated those, maybe through brainstorming sessions, asking lots of questions. And finally, you have to begin elaborating. As Thomas Edison said, success is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. So the elaboration stage is the perspiration. It's a stage where you're testing your minimum viable products, you're piloting. So what I would encourage you all to do, um, if you haven't done so already, is take um, a very, uh, one of the many wonderful free courses out there on artificial intelligence. Because regardless of what job you do, you will be affected in some way by AI. So you will need to start to understand the basic terminology of the area. So you can think, well, how can I apply this? How can I increase my productivity, the productivity of my team? How can we develop better products and services for our clients and customers using AI? So there's a lot of free courses out there. Coursera has a number of very good ones. Google has a great one. There's another company called FutureLearn that's based in the UK. Go and take one of these fantastic courses on AI. So what is the one thing you're going to do to increase uh, creativity in your personal life? Is it going to be around spending the first 10 minutes of any brainstorming of any morning, just gen, um, doing your morning pages, just getting three pages, stream of consciousness thoughts out to the page. What is the one thing you're gonna to do to, to unlock creativity in your team? Maybe it's just about changing how you do those ideation sessions, those brainstorming sessions. You focus on spending the first 10 minutes brainstorming the questions themselves. And what is the one thing you're gonna to do to unlock creativity in your organization. Perhaps you're going to uh, start doing some of this AI, learning about how AI can affect the work of your organization. So in terms of next steps, what you can be doing next here, uh, I would I, I go and speak all around the world. I'm happy if you wanna reach out to uh, myself or the team at uh, Right Selection Speaker Bureau who have offices in, in India as well, and you can bring me in to come and give a speech. I speak to all different industries, uh, all around the world. I speak obviously a lot in Asia, a lot in India. So, and my speeches tend to be 30 minutes or, or 90 minutes. You can also bring me in to come and do a workshop. It could be a half day workshop or a full day workshop. We can even do multi day, what we call off site retreats as well. We, we've done these now in Italian villas and French chateaus and Scottish castles. We even have certification available. This is a picture of me doing one in Singapore just the other day. And I've just come back from uh, South America where we just ran uh, with these with cosmetics companies in Latin America with banks. Uh, this is the, uh, the government, Singapore government we were doing them with, with a corporation Favorita, which is uh, a big uh, shopping, they have shopping malls all around the country as well. So I love doing workshops. So you, you have the keynotes, you have the workshops I would love to come in and do for you. And obviously you're gonna be able to see my online course, but we can also make, if you enjoy that, we can also make the online course available for all of your employees as well, so they can start to upskill themselves creatively. And we, at the moment, we have these in the course in Arabic, English, and Spanish uh, just now. So those are your options. I would love to come in, bring me in to come and give a keynote speech, or perhaps a workshop, a half day or a full day workshop, or perhaps um, to do one of these online courses. And as we said, you, all of you that are on this uh, webinar just now, we're going to give you access to that online course for free, just so you can see what that is like as well. I'll leave you with a final little story. This is another game. This isn't the game of chess, this is the game of Go. Go is a much more complicated game than chess. There are more potential moves in the game of Go than there are atoms in the universe. It's a beautiful game. And this game of Go was between Lee si do which is the gentleman you see on the right from South Korea, and Google's DeepMind, which was an AI that had learned how to play the game of Go. No one thought a machine, an artificial intelligence, could do as well on a game as complex and as beautiful as Go. But in the first few games, the AI kept winning. But in game four, something extraordinary happened. In opening, in, in a move, it's called Move 78, the AI, the human there, which is Lee Si Do, played a move that was so creative, so innovative, so inspired, that it immediately took the game to an entirely new level. Amongst the world of Go players, it's been dubbed the God's Touch. So here's my question for you. Would Lee Seedol, the human, have ever have played a move and pushed himself further if he hadn't have been challenged by an artificial intelligence? Today, the world's best Go players play game after game alongside AIs and are seeing their world ranking skyrocket because these technologies will actually help us unlock something of our true human creative potential. 
I believe everyone is born with almost unlimited creative potential. On this call just now, there could be someone that's going to completely revolutionize their field or their industry. That person could be you. But you will only get there today if you go from saying to yourself, not just I am creative, but augmenting your creativity with exponential technologies like AI to be able to say to yourself, I am super creative. My name is James Taylor. Thank you very much for listening. And I hope I've given you your crayons back today and giving you a little bit of spark, a creative spark to unlock your creative potential. And on that note, I think we're going to get to some, some Q&As. So, um, Sarika, should, uh, maybe should people just enter any questions they have in the chat box? I'm happy to answer any in the time that we have left available. Yeah, I'm just struggling to hear uh, you, Sarika, just now. So if you're, if you're watching this, you can, hopefully you can still hear me just now. Um, just le leave any questions that you have. Just leave them in the chat box here. Hi, James. Can you hear me now? I've got you now. Great. Great. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, if there's any questions, you can put it in chat box or else you can just simply raise your hand and we can give them the mic as well. Um, Great. For me, James, thank you so much. I think that was very, very insightful. Uh, for me, some of the takeaways is specifically the morning pages. I'm